Hare Krishna. So, we'll be discussing today on the Bhagavad Gita's last section, chapters 13 to 18. And I believe that all of you have already done the Bhakti Shastri in detail. So, this will be more of a summary study. So, I was thinking of taking this in different ways. But one way we could do the summary is look at the flow of the Gita. Another way we could look at the concepts of the Gita. And the third we could do is look at the applications of the Gita. So, I will take a little bit of all three. But we won't be necessarily going verse by verse. But I will try to focus more on the application of the Gita. What does application mean in this context? Arjun had a question, a driving question. And what was his question? What was the question he asked? Does anyone remember? Yes? Okay, not the 13th chapter, but the, the uh, driving question of the Bhagavad Gita itself. What, what is the question which starts the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah? I am not able to decide. Please guide me. Please guide me, yes. What is he not able to decide? Yes. Whether to fight or not fight, that was a specific in dilemma confronting him. But a more fundamental question was, Prichami Twam Dharma Sammudha Chetaha. When he surrenders to Krishna, he is asking, please tell me what is Dharma. So in yesterday's class, I talked about how that the study of matter and the study of what matters. So Arjun is not asking anything about, you know, which arrows to use, which weapons to use, what archery skills to use. This is all the study of matter. The study of what matters, what is truly important for me? Is the kingdom more important, or is the lives of my life of my relatives more important? So dharma essentially means a discussion of what is the most important thing in life, based on which we can live. So we all can live for pleasure. At every moment in our life, we have some responsibilities, but there's something which can give us pleasure. So we could just choose the pleasures and neglect the responsibilities. But is that a meaningful way to live? So that's a so Arjuna's question is dharma, and that question itself, what is dharma? What is the right course of action? What is a meaningful way to live? That is the driving question of the Bhagavad Gita, and Krishna answers it at different levels, and I won't go over. The way he has answered in the first six, first twelve chapters, but essentially, uh, we could see so when we give an answer to a question, so there are different ways of doing a reasoning, and sometimes one reasoning clicks to one person, another reasoning clicks to another person. Say, for example, if somebody asks us, "Why don't you eat meat?" Now, sometimes we might tell somebody who is a very, uh, who is what they call a health nut. That person, if you tell them about the health benefits of vegetarian food, that might persuade them. Somebody who is very soft-hearted, compassionate, who loves animals, you tell them about how and how much pain animals go through when they are slaughtered, that might convince them. So basically the idea is, if we give a multi-dimensional answer or a multi-level reasoning, so it's one way is to shoot arrow straight. Another is to shoot an arrow from different directions. So we, the point Krishna is driving is from different directions towards one conclusion. And the point he is driving towards is that Arjuna needs to do his duty in the mood of service to the Lord. In that, that we will talk about it in due course. But So the first six chapters talk about this in terms of karma. Do your duty and by doing karma gradually you will attain liberation. You will attain freedom from bondage. So broadly in the Vedic context there are three different paths, karma, bhakti and jnana. So the first three chapters talk about how karma will lead Arjuna to the path of right duty. And the middle six chapters will talk about how bhakti will lead him to the right course of action. And in many ways by the tenth chapter the Bhagavad Gita is over. Because Krishna has told Chaturshloki Gita and in response to that, Arjun has said that Sarvame Tadritam Manye, I accept everything that you say. Param Brahma Param Dhamma. So, almost 
uh, so the essential message is conveyed in 10.8 to 11 10 8 to 11 and arjun accepts it in 10 12 13 14 15 so then after that the whole bhagavad gita is led more or less by question answers so it's like suppose if we have a long class in which say the class is for one hour and then after that you have 45 minutes question answers so like that you could say the bhagavad gita is a class which ends by the 10th chapter and 10th chapter to 18th chapter is like the question answer session of course you could say the whole bhagavad gita itself is a question answer session but while that is true uh, but that you could say that there are there might be one question which starts a whole class mm -hmm. and then while answering that question sometimes in between so that means the speaker has one thought flow and within that somebody asks some questions but the speaker completes the talk and then there are questions so some questions may be related directly with the previous content of the talk and some questions may be what we have heard elsewhere and then you want to understand okay this is what i've heard here you this is what you said how do i make sense of both of them so that's why if you look at the questions which come after the 10th chapter you may not immediately find any direct point that krishna has made previously which leads to this question it's like say if we have a question answer session it's not necessary that if say, there are six questions at the end of a class it's not that the question two will necessarily follow from question one question two and question one might be completely unrelated or they could be uh, related so there could be if you see consider if there could be broadly four possibilities and we'll explore these possibilities say if somebody gives a class and then you have six questions after the class so question one might be based on what was spoken in the class the question two could be also based on the class question two could be based on of uh, something which came up in question one question two could be something which is entirely different which the speaker which the speaker might just have remotely referred to and then the uh, speaker brings it up and question two might also be something completely unrelated but i just want to know about it so there could be different reasons how the questions arise so in a sense if you look at chapter 13 and you try to link it to chapter 12 there is no explicit link although we could make out a link and see um, when we study scripture and study the Bhagavad Gita when we want to make links between say this verse and this verse or this chapter and that chapter this section and that section there could be multiple links that can be made because different acharyas can analyze the Bhagavad Gita in different ways and this is how this link can be made here this is how this link can be made here so, and different Achar uh, so that way we could also explain it in different ways now 13th chapter as you mentioned what is the first verse in the 13th chapter <coughs> does anyone know broadly the verse not necessarily the sanskrit but the question okay um, maybe we could do one thing if you have you ha have this can you project the Bhagavad Gita's verses here we could recite that then if it is possible hmm? some of them will recite sorry so the question is interestingly that and there are different versions of the Bhagavad Gita and more or less the Bhagavad Gita is in world religious history considered to be one of the most stable books stable means that sometimes some things change because if there are thousands and thousands of texts if you look at the Bible not only the English translations are different but many of the original verses themselves are different but the Bhagavad Gita because it's a small book and it has been repeatedly commented so therefore the changes are almost negligible one of the few changes is in some renditions of the Bhagavad Gita this question by Arjuna is, is not there and in Prabhupada's Gita and other Gitas this question is there so the question we could say act as a as a link but it's again not explicitly a link because what does it link previously to the six things he asks about Prakriti, Purusha, Kshetra, Kshetragya, Jnana and Genya. Now these are concepts associated with the system of Sankhya. Does anyone know what is Sankhya? 
analytical study okay that is true see in india uh, based on the vedas six systems of philosophies arose so the vedas are basically books uh, there there are the four major vedas the upanishads now these books are what they are <coughs> but the books don't give like one systematic system of philosophy i'll repeat this that the vedas don't give one systematic system of philosophy what do i mean by systematic system of philosophy say if you read a newspaper about new zealand or you read a if you just come to new zealand now and you read a daily newspaper about new zealand or you read a magazine about new zealand now you will come to know a lot about new zealand by that but that won't be the same as coming to know about the geography of new zealand or the history of new zealand there could be a separate book to teach that so the so the scriptures they don't start with now we are going to tell you this philosophy they're just scriptures are basically conversations like the bhagavad gita is a conversation like that the way upanishads themselves are conversations the vedas themselves are incantations they're mantras now so based on the content of the vedic scriptures what is the essential philosophy of these scriptures so there is a literature which is a book and philosophy is a system of thought so from one book uh, we could say what is the system of thought this book is teaching so that different people have arrived at different inferences so that the six systems of philosophy are basically they are they are uh, six uh, schools of thought or six philosophies that are based on the vedas that means different people study the vedas and some people say actually the essential teaching of vedas is sankhya some people say it's mimamsa some people say it is vaisheshika eight some people say it is vedanta so like that there are six systems now sankhya focuses primarily on analysis divide things into their components and by such analysis we try to understand the nature of reality so so all these six systems were prevalent when arjuna was there and the mahabharat was occurring so arjuna had heard all these terms so now krishna has given a devotional world view wherein he has talked about how everything comes from him how everything rests in him so then arjun wants to understand okay i have heard these other terms what do these terms mean so let's recite this verse together arjun uvacha arjun uvacha together prakritim purusham chaiva kshetra kshetragyameva cha etad veditum ichami gyanam yeyam cha keshava yes okay okay anwars let's focus on this so this is the question so six terms is asking now you as i said because from the 10th chapter onwards it's question answer starting that's why you may not find anything at the end of the 12th chapter where krishna has used these terms and then arjun is asking so the, these six terms are not used by krishna anywhere specifically specifically he has used it generically at various places but it is okay i've heard these terms what do these terms mean now you have given me this understanding within this understanding what do these terms mean so earlier also in the 8th chapter arjun has asked about the meaning of some terms kim tad brahma kim adhyatmam kim karma purushottama now but that is very contextual because the last verses 729 <coughs> 30 of the of the previous chapter involve some terms so krishna so krishna uses some terms and just like in a class if we don't if somebody uses some word which we don't understand and then we might say what do you mean by this word so at that time it's like this but here it is a general understanding now of course we could connect it with certain sections of the bhagavad gita which have gone previously that <coughs> the the world view of sankhya has been referred to by krishna repeatedly in the bhagavad gita now going back to the earlier point of um the earlier point of how krishna is coming to the conclusion of bhakti of what is the right course of action if by different directions 
So some people say that the Bhagavad Gita allows for different paths for different people. For karma, for people who want to follow the karma yoga, it allows karma yoga. For those who want to follow, follow jnana yoga, it allows jnana yoga. For those who want to follow bhakti yoga, it, it provides bhakti yoga verses also. That is true, of course. The Bhagavad Gita accommodates and acknowledges the power of various paths. At the same time, it also gives a conclusion about which path is most important. So now, if you go forward from here, broadly speaking, this chapter has 35 verse texts. And now, when this question is asked, so when he asks this question, Krishna starts answering the question. So maybe, is it possible that somebody could write over there a few things? I thought if it's, it's here, then I could write. But, is it possible? Maybe uh, you can sit here also if possible, so that you don't have to keep standing all the time, whenever required. So basically, uh, 2 to 7. 2 to 7, you keep this open only, bro. Keep this on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So text 2 to 7 are answering the question. Just write. Uh, okay. Just 2 to 7. Two dash seven. Two to, uh, so you can say explains mm -hmm. Kshetra and Kshetragya. So Arjun has asked six terms and Krishna puts those terms together and he answers them Kshetra and Kshetragya. So, what Krishna does is, see sometimes in a, uh, if sometimes, you know, in a class, some people ask, I just ask one question, but then they ask that one question for five minutes and in that there might be five questions, <laughs> isn't it? So then what happens is the speaker might not necessarily answer if there are five questions within it, they may not answer the first question first, second question first, they might try to create a structure over there, so that there is conceptual development. So. So, what is the, the, so Krishna asks about six terms, Arjuna asks about six terms. So, Arjuna first asks about Prakriti and, pra, prakriti and Purusha. Prakriti and Purusha, Kshetra, Kshetra, Gyanam, Gyanam, Gyanam. So, then what happens is, so, the first question which Krishna is asked, Krishna answers that the last. So, he starts with Kshetra and Kshetra, Gya, then he answers Gyana and Gya, and then he goes to Prakriti and Purusha. So, you could just, I think you can write it right now, 8 to 17 okay 8 to 19 rather 8 to 19 is a uh, krishna explains jnana and gaya then 20 to 27 and gaya jnana and gaya and then 20 to 27 he explains you could, uh, that last thing, Prakriti and Purusha. And last eight verses, yeah. okay, Prakriti and Purusha, and 28 to 35, <coughs> 28 to 35, he talks about, the, no, no, there's no, okay, you could say, explains a uh, integrated shastra chakshu explains integrated shastra chakshu that means how to see the world in an integrated way the idea here is integrated shastra chakshu shastra s h a shastra chakshu shastra chakshu is the eyes of scripture so how to see all this together means these terms how do we apply it to see yeah you can sit now thank you thank you so, now I will not go into the detailed flow of things, but I will just broadly explain the terms. And so, Kshetra and Kshetrakya, what is he talking about over here? So, basically, if we look at the world around us, we will see at a very fundamental level that there are things and there are beings. There are objects and there are subjects. Subjects means people are there. That is a very fundamental categorization that we can see. So, that is the basic principle in this analysis. analysis. So, Kshetra and Kshetra. Again. Now, what is the difference between things and beings? One is that beings have knowledge. We, can, we are aware. 
so kshetra refers to so now this basic classification is what we'll come to at the end prakriti and purusha so prakriti is matter which is unconscious and from prakriti various objects come up so we can have a table we can have a sofa we can have a house all this is prakriti and its variations purusha is the conscious being who acts on prakriti and now this we could say is the fundamental classification which krishna will come to at the end but based on this fundamental classification of prakriti and purusha now there is matter and there is consciousness but all of us we have control over some area of matter say for example now i have control over my body now i can decide i'll raise my hand and i can raise my hand now if i tell any of you please raise your hand you may raise your hand because say you are, we are in a relationship right now where uh, you're trying to learn something so you might do it but if you just suddenly go in the street and tell them raise somebody raise your hand <laughs> why should i <laughs> so you know, we don't have any control over there so basically kshetra refers to that part of prakriti over which we have control kshetra is what that part of prakriti prakriti is matter prakriti is material nature but as uh, so a consciousness or purusha acts on material nature but we can't act everywhere we can act on some part of material nature so the part of material nature the part of prakriti on which we can act that is called as kshetra so <clears throat> suppose somebody becomes somebody gets paral paralysis then they, they, their hand gets paralyzed or their foot gets paralyzed then although they may have that body but they don't have much control over that so kshetra is not necessary like a fixed area it's not necessarily related with our body it could be related with our body but broadly the idea is where what we know and what we seek to control so now within this it is not mentioned over here but the bhagavad gita is not mentioned but the acharya has mentioned it that there are different koshas different levels of consciousness based on what we seek to control like a small newborn baby the baby is in annamay kosh that means it sees the whole world as potential food <laughs> experience the world primarily are putting it in mouth you know take a toy take a take their own finger take their own toe whatever it is put in their mouth so when we look at the world and how we try to interact with the world how we observe the world how do we control the world so that is shaped by our kshetra at that time so the kshetra is the area of material nature which we know which we try to control which we interact with and kshetra gya is the knower of this area the conscious being so now kshetra gya krishna says there are two kinds of kshetra gya there's this atma and the paramatma and the paramatma is primarily the one who knows all kshetras and the atma is one who knows each particular kshetra so this is the first concept which krishna explains that kshetra and kshetra gya mm -hmm. any questions till now okay now after explaining this the words can have uh, uh, different meanings in different contexts so gyana can just mean knowledge and yes it is knowledge but when in, in this technical context we are using the word so see words can have general <coughs> meanings words can have technical meanings say for example if if there's a scientist and a scientist is working in the laboratory uh, and then they say oh we have run out of energy and that probably means they had some battery the battery is discharged or the device is discharged but when that same scientist comes back home and tells their partner i have run out of energy but that doesn't mean you get a electricity can charge it isn't it so energy can refer narrowly technically to what powers a particular like gadget and energy can refer to also physical so there can be technical and general meanings 
and based on the context we understand what meaning is being referred to if somebody says i have uh, i have run out of energy okay where is your charger i'll put you in the socket it doesn't work like that isn't it <laughs> so gyan when krishna uses the word over here he uses it in a specific sense so he he talks about that that knowledge which will help the kshetragya come out of kshetra help the purusha come out of prakriti the gyana which will lead to liberation and that's why we can talk about knowledge in various terms nowadays when you talk about knowledge you may talk about say technical knowledge or we have what is those four fields called which are s there's some acronym science tech stem stem what is it science, technology, technology engineering mathematics. mathematics yes so now uh, stem if somebody has any knowledge in these fields then we say that oh this person can uh, has some knowledge by which they can earn something so knowledge can be of different categories now the bhagavad gita if you look at the context in the context of the bhagavad gita krishna is not interested not as arjuna interested in like elaborate knowledge about everything his knowledge is what his question is what is the right course of action so terms will also be defined and explained in that way so what does arjun means in the right course of action he thinks if i fight i will become bound i'll get karma and therefore i should not fight so then what is the way i can act by which i will not get karma i'll not get bondage but i'll be liberated so liberation essentially means that the purusha and the prakriti are bound together so the purusha comes out of the prakriti the soul comes out of matter so when krishna talks about gyan over here he talks it in terms of the qualities which we can develop by which we can come out of bondage so that's why here is not talking knowledge in terms of information he's talking knowledge more in terms of transformation knowledge in terms of virtues which we can develop by which we will be able to grow in our lives virtues by which we will be able to uh, develop by which we will be able to learn and grow so that's why it talks about humility pridelessness mahanitvam adamitvam ahimsa kshantir arjun <coughs> so in this section 8 to 19 we could say 8 to 12 krishna is explaining gyana and in 13 to 19 he is explaining gyana so gyana is that which will enable that knowledge which will enable one to gain liberation to become free from bondage now after having talked about this gyana then he talks about gyana now gyana is that which is to be known that which we want to know in every area we don't consciously differentiate but we do differentiate say for example somebody studies engineering okay what what are you studying engineering but gyan is what is it that is the object that you are studying for that means no i'm studying engineering but what what do you want by studying engineering oh i want a job i want money so what has happened there is a, there is a, there's something which you are studying there and there's something which you hope to gain by the study so there's a differentiation between the two so gyana is the process by which we can gain knowledge so gyan is not so much uh information but earlier i said gyan is the, that which will lead us to liberation the development of qualities so the process by which we will gain knowledge and thereby gain liberation but and gyanya is what is it that we will gain knowledge about so in that sense gyan in this section is the same as kshetragya what do we want to know ultimately we want to know ourselves we want to know this we want to understand ourselves we want to understand god basically if you look at life in every situation what is it that we want to know say for example if we are if you are work, if you are working at a particular job <clears throat> then you could say oh i need to learn these technical skills uh, i need to learn who is working at what post i need to develop right contacts all that is true but if you go beyond the specifics what do we want to know 
we want to know what is the structure of reality what is the scheme of things over here what is the overall nature of things and then we want to know what is my place and purpose in the scheme of things isn't it say if you are if you get employment in a company you want to know okay what does this company do so you want to know about the overall scheme nature of things overall scheme of things and then we want to know okay what am i meant to do in this company so similarly when it's talk about geya if you see when uh, arjun answer uh, arjun's question krishna answers from 13 to 19 he says first understand the overall nature of reality that means you understand god understand how god controls the world how the world work under the control of god and then understand yourself when you understand yourself then you can work within that whole scheme of things so gyana and gyaya refers to this so knowledge we can have you could say almost an unlimited amount of knowledge of any subject nowadays with uh, knowledge expanding so much is like people can study small 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 subjects and one of my friends he did a i think i mentioned last time and come he did a phd in the digestive system of alaskan mosquitoes how we may say why did okay so it's so specific okay you might say that you know even without your phd the mosquitoes were digesting their food <laughs> so we could study anything and you could say it's a worthy object of study fine it's it you could say it's a worthy object of study but what is the most worthy object of study what is really important so if you can say that this, this is what we want to know. okay what is the nature of reality and what is my place and purpose in it so generally if say so we all learn about it so all of you are sitting here comfortably now now every one of us you every one of you is reasonably confident that the person next to you is not suddenly going to turn and slap you in the face <laughs> <laughs> now we may say how can we be so confident <laughs> because what happens we have there is innate capacity to discern what is going on in a particular place and then to find out our role in that place so wherever we go we look at what are other people doing and then we look at what am i meant to do and we start acting out so if you come to a place and everybody is silent over there then we won't be noisy over there or even if you are noisy and you say everybody is silent we also become silent over there so basically this is what we need to know what is the overall structure of reality and what am i meant to do in the structure of reality now of course somebody may want to be deliberately disruptive but then also they have a particular purpose over there but we all normally we have that innate awareness of what's going on around us and how we can fit into it so basically krishna talks about gyana as the process by which we can gain knowledge for liberation and gyaya as the object of knowledge now within this krishna uses a lot of upanishadic language now the upanishads are meant for intellectual people so among all the chapters in the bhagavad gita the 13 chapter is the toughest and uh, so uh, if all this is even too technical don't worry about it too much this is the toughest chapter we are starting with so th so the 13th chapter is krishna uses upanishadic language to explain concepts for people who come from the gyana background say for example now we might just say radha and krishna are the divine couple we have the beautiful pictures over there but if somebody is a very intellectual person they are the divine couple they need things to be explained much more intellectually so we may i might say that you now radha represents the primordial cosmological feminine principle and krishna represents the primordial cosmological masculine principle <laughs> wow <laughs> so so the so the upanishads are studied by gyanis and they like they don't like things to be too simple 
they want things to be explained in sufficiently sophisticated ways. That's why in the 13th chapter, you will see Krishna uses a lot of paradoxical terminology. He says that that absolute truth, he says for example, Sarvatapani Padam Tad, can you just go to 14th text over here? So first he says uh, that, text 14, actually you could just drag it down. No? Okay, you know what you could do? I won't need the translation, so you could you can after this you can just go down, go up, rather, go up. Just change the default view over here. Yeah, I'll just show the verse, and even if I show an advanced view, and uh, you go up. I yeah, just show the purport Sanskrit. Remove, remove. remove the purport. Remove in the translation. Remove translation. Just keep the Sanskrit. All of you can read Devanagari, isn't it? Okay, keep the English. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you want to increase the resolution or everybody can see? Everybody can see here? Yeah, this is good. So, now if you see this text is saying that every text 14 says everywhere are his hands and legs. Sarve, sarvata, Pani padam tad sarvato akshishiro mukham everywhere are eyes ears everywhere is mouth hmm. but if you go to the this is 14 just go to the next verse it says that that absolute truth sarvendriya guna bhasam sarvendriya vivarjitam that that absolute truth is the source of all the senses but that absolute truth has no senses sarvendriya vivarjitam asaktam sarva bhrukchaiva Asaktam means there is no attachment. But at the same time, he is maintaining everyone. Normally, if we take care of someone, like parents take care of children, naturally some attachment develops. So he says, he is, he is not attached to anyone, but he is maintaining everyone. Nirgunam guna bhoktrucha. He is beyond all the modes, but still he is the master of the modes. So Krishna is talking here in paradoxical terms. There is a contradiction and there is a paradox. Contradiction is where two points are just opposite. But paradox is where two, two opposite words or two opposite points are brought together to convey some deeper truth. Mm. So if somebody is, if you tell if you tell somebody that's a that's a brilliant mistake. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You know? Is that brilliant or is it a mistake? No, you could say that, you know, it's a it's a, there could be a foolish mistake, but there could be a brilliant mistake also. What do you mean by brilliant mistake? You, know, you have to think about it. What does it mean? It could mean that only a brilliant person could make a mistake like this. <laughs> or it could mean through the mistake, something brilliant has come out. So the point is that sometimes we might bring two opposite ideas together to convey something deeper. So that's what Krishna is doing throughout. So in this section, when Krishna is talking about the Gnyo, the object of knowledge, he is saying that object of knowledge is the all-pervading absolute truth. So it has, it has no senses. That means it has no material body, it is not material. But that doesn't mean he, that absolute truth is deep impersonal. The absolute truth has the capacity to perceive. The absolute truth has the capacity to observe, to hear, to see. Because there are transcendental senses. So Krishna is talking about that object of knowledge, Gnyo over here. Hmm? So actually, Gnya, uh, the spelling should be J N E Y A. That's okay. I think most of you know about it. So Gnya, J N E Y A. So this is Gnya. Any questions till now? Now let's go on to the third part. After talking about Kshetra, Kshetra, Gnya, and Gnya, then Krishna talks about Purusha and Prakriti. And there he basically starts by telling that both Purusha and Prakriti are eternal. Prakriti mm Purusham Chaiva Vidya Anadi Ubhava P. Can you just go down to text 19 and 20? So, Prakriti mm Purusham Chaiva Vidya Anadi Ubhava P. Next one, next one. Yeah. So, Vidya Anadi Ubhava P. Ubhava is both. No. That both of them are eternal. 
so matter is eternal and consciousness is also eternal now when we say matter is not eternal isn't it matter is temporary actually it's not matter that is temporary it is material forms that are temporary and what we are attached to is material forms it's material forms that is we are attached to a beautiful house but suppose a quake comes and the house crumbles then the matter that made the house is still there but we are not attached to that matter isn't it so when krishna is saying matter is also eternal so understanding that matter is eternal is important to understand that actually krishna is not so much a creator as a initiator what is the difference between the two that there's a recently on whatsapp some person was criticizing and he says if brahma is the creator then how did a lotus exist before him <laughs> no that can seem like a good question but the point is in our understanding brahma is not the original creator brahma is the secondary creator and even if you consider the original creator also the bhagavatam gives the example that brahma is like a gardener rochitam rochiyam yaham so a gardener has seeds and gardener has a place a soil or a garden and gardener put the seed and the gardener has to tend but that's how everything comes about so in our philosophical understanding matter also is eternal and because matter is eternal that means that even when we talk about creation maintenance destruction destruction is not destruction of matter is destruction of material forms it is just that matter withdraws into itself it withdraws into itself just like say we can have aata we can have flower a flower when you have now that flower is shapeless and you could make that into a dough and then you can make it into chapatis or parathas or bread or whatever so the bread is a particular form but say suppose we use we we make a particular pile for cooking and then you find okay now all the cooking is done now just withdraw it if no more is needed then you are just put it back in the mount so the dow is there but the dow can have particular shapes and those shapes can be transformed so that some edible items come up but if that transformation is not no longer, no longer required then what happens the dow is kept as it is you might have cooked something more but you put it in the big mass and keep it in the fridge so like that in our understanding matter is also eternal so the dow always exists but from the dow sometimes we make chapatis sometimes we make various objects like that so krishna prakriti and purusha both are eternal and what is what is the problem then if prakriti is also eternal purusha is eternal then we can say if we are eternal then we can just eternally enjoy life over here itself but the problem is the forms are temporary we get attached to the forms and when the forms are destroyed we suffer now how do this attachment come about let's recite the 20 can you go to 22nd text this is called by our acharyas as the bija vakya this is the seed from which the entire remaining six chapters come out so let's recite this verse purusha prakriti sthohi bhunte prakriti jan gunan karanam gun sangosya sada sadyoni janmasu so prakritim purusham chaiva so the into the prakriti into the material nature purusha the soul gets entangled with <coughs> sorry purusha prakriti sorry purusha prakriti sthohi the soul becomes situated in the material nature how bhungte prakriti jan gunan because of the desire to enjoy so this meta this metaphor i will use in this whole section later also but briefly you could say somebody is sitting at their home and they are watching a tv now they may be comfortable in their home but once they start watching a tv maybe there's a movie going on there's a sports match going on now to the extent they are engrossed in the tv to that extent they will experience all kinds of emotions in relationship with the tv so similar now that the person is different from the tv and whatever is happening is depicted on the tv screen but as long as their consciousness is caught over there they experience like that so similarly the soul is different from matter purusha and prakriti are two different things prakriti is here purusha is here but purusha prakriti sthohi 
the soul's consciousness gets situated in prakriti. Once it gets situated in prakriti, then boom, te. Why does it get situated? Because of wanting to enjoy. What do you want to enjoy? Prakriti jan gunan. From prakriti, the modes come up, the, and from the modes, various objects come up. So, if you consider on a TV screen, whatever, or on a computer screen, whatever is being seen, it's just actually simply pixels. And if you study electronic engineering, it's just RGB, RYB, three color dots, they come in various shapes over there. So, like that, by the modes, certain objects are emerged, objects emerge. And when you desire to enjoy the objects, then sad asad yoni janmasu. So Krishna is talking from a very big perspective over here that he just says when we are watching a movie, we think, oh, this is a romantic movie. But then you find out, you watch for some time, then you say, hey, it's a horror movie. <laughs> hey, what happened? <laughs> so like that, we might experience some joy when it's a nice um, humor or romance is going on. But then some horrible things are happening. These are fear or horror or pain. So sad asad. So as long as we are caught in watching the movie, we experience good and bad. And this is not just a few moments, based on how we are entangled, we might go into a good birth and we might go into a bad birth also. See, bad birth doesn't necessarily even mean lower species. Even in uh, human species, people throughout history have uh, lived in terrible conditions. You know, we talk about Dukkhalaya and nowadays we have to explain to people how the world is Dukkhalaya. Because to some extent, we could say, maybe the last 50 or so years, the world is having relatively peaceful times. Of course, still there are attacks of terrorists and there are natural disruptions. But before that, there were constant wars would be happening. And even if you look at the uh, say history a few hundred or few thousand years ago, you know, there is horrible things. So when there would be people would be coal workers, say in Britain or Europe, no, they would have to actually go inside a coal mine. So walk sometimes three, four miles and the coal tunnels would be very small. And they would have to bend down and walk. And after they walk over there, then for eight hours, they had to hit against the walls to break the coal from the walls. And then come back. And like that, day in, day out, throughout their life, it's eight hours working and they would be paid only for the eight hours. But two hours they would have to walk up and walk down, nobody would pay them for that. And I am just giving one example. But the point is, it is a human birth, but it can be a horrible human birth. So there is, we don't have to necessarily imagine hell in some other world. Hell can, hellish conditions have occurred on the earth also. And we could say at some places they are there even now. So, Asad, asad, yoni janma. So why? Based on our, the way we have become entangled in material nature, sometimes we experience good, sometimes we experience bad. And then after talking about this, then Krishna talks about various ways in which the Purusha can come out of Prakriti. And he gives, can you go down to the 25th verse? 25th verse talks about the four ways, broadly speaking, by which we can come out. So you can recite this verse after me, it's a little difficult. Dhyane Natmani Pashanti Dhyane Natmani Pashanti Kechid Atmanam Atmana Kechid Atmanam Atmana Anye Sankhena Yogena Anye Sankhena Yogena Karma Yogena Chapare Karma Yogena Chapare So here Krishna says, okay, somebody is caught in watching that TV and they're lost. They're suppose the child is watching a horror movie and the child is completely horrified. And now, sometimes the people get so caught in watching a horror movie and they're seeing some dangerous shape-shifting monster over there. And even if the mother is nearby and the mother sees the child in horror, but if the mother just goes and taps the child, ah! the child will start screaming. So, although the mother is right there, there is, there is no, if the child is too caught in that, uh, then you cannot actually uh, immediately interrupt over there. There's a, there's, a, there's a gradual way in which it can be done. So similarly, the soul is entangled in matter, but how does the soul come out of matter? So Krishna says there are these four ways. He says, Jnane, Dhyane, Atmani, Pashyanti. So instead of just watching the movie, that person starts dhyan, doing Dhyan, thinking deeply, drawing their thoughts inwards. Okay, I'm watching the movie, but where am I? So. 
Many times in our day to day lives also when people meditate, they start taking some deep breath, close their eyes. If they, if they don't go to sleep, <laughs> they can feel relatively calmer. Because the world, it just fills us with so many stimuli, many of them are agitating. So if we just withdraw from the world, some um, it's not that we are liberated or disentangled, but at least temporarily we have withdrawn from it. So one would be dhyanin, atmani, pashanti. So you withdraw from the illusion. Kechit atma anam atmana, kechit is some people. They turn inwards and they perceive the atma. Here there is a, a alliteration, the word atma is used twice. Atma anam atmana. This is the, you could say the uh, favorite wordplay of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Like some, some people, they have particular words that they use very often. Like say somebody is teenagers, they like to use the word awesome. Nah, awesome, oh that's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome. And it's almost like that, anybody who uses that word, say, yeah, is, it, is this a teenager using it? So that word has become associated with teenagers. Of course others can use it, no problem. But the thing is, that everybody has certain typical word that they use. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita uses this play of word with Atmana, Atmana many times. So one other meaning of the word Atma, one the word Atma can mean mind, and the word Atma can mean also in the soul. So Uddhare Atmana 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 Mavasadayet Atma Iva Atmana Obandhur Atma Iva Rupur Atmana. That's six five in the Bhagavad Gita. So similarly here, when he's saying, what is he saying? Dhyanen Atmani Pashanti. With Dhyana, one can see the Atma. Kechid Atmanam Atmana. So the word is used three times here. <coughs> By the mind directed inwards, one can see oneself. One can see the spiritual reality. Anye Sankhena Yogena. Others can se start separating. This is matter, this is spirit. And gradually, by so one is by meditation, the other is by analysis. And karma yogena chapare by working with detachment gradually also one can come out now well, uh, but beyond that and Krishna also says you can practice bhakti yoga that's the next verse he says just here next text is uh, anye tvayo majananta you can go to text 26th anye tvayo majananta shutva anyebhyo pasate te pichati tarantyeva mrityum shuti parayanaha if you just hear regularly that means, okay, I'm watching this illusion, but I hear. As I keep hearing regularly, gradually I'll start learning. When I start learning, I start growing by that. So hearing is extremely important. And this is the path of bhakti, basically. So, after talking about this, at this point, more or less, Krishna completes the, this is 26, can you go to 27? Okay. Okay, so actually there you could change that to, 20 to 26 and 27 onwards. I I recite with sometimes with the Gita press Gita, so I get a little confused by the numbers. So 26 and then 27. So till 26 is Prakriti and Purusha is explained. And Krishna also tells how to come, the Prakriti can come out of Purusha. And then after this, if you get all this knowledge, how should we look at the world? How should we look at the world? So, of course, this is again a very philosophical subject, but I will not go into all of it. Krishna says that just don't look at people and their actions, don't look at objects. Krishna says, learn to see there is matter and there is consciousness. And if you can see in this way, can you go to 29? Samam Pashyanhi Sarvatra. Yeah, let's recite this. It's a very beautiful verse. Samam Pashyanhi Sarvatra. Samavasthitam Ishwaram Samavasthitam Ishwaram Nahinasthyatmanatmanam Nahinasthyatmanatmanam Tato Yati Param Gatim Tato Yati Param Gatim So he says, Krishna says, if you could see that all living beings are equal, Samam Pashyan Hi Sarvatra You can see, see everyone equally. What can you see equally? <coughs> <clears throat> that in everyone, the Ishwara, the Lord is situated. That means, if some, some people might be very kind to me, some people might be very unkind to me. But I just don't look at their kindness or unkindness. I see that actually it is God who is present here and God is allowing different people to act in different ways. So if we, if we see, then we think, okay, how can I serve the Lord? 
what does Krishna want me to do in this situation? How can I best serve? If we do like this, then na hinastyatmanatmanam. Hinasti means to go down, to become degraded. Atmanatmana. The soul will not become degraded by the mind. But rather, tatoyati parangatem. One will attain the supreme perfection. So, the whole purpose of this whole elaborate analysis is to ultimately become more Krishna conscious, to become more spiritually conscious. They don't just see the way ignorant people see. Oh, this person is my enemy, this person is my friend. Of course, we have to see that if some person is behaving like an enemy and some person is behaving like a friend. So, equal vision does not necessarily mean equal action. From a biological perspective, you could say a cat and a tiger. Both are felines, both are in the cat family itself. So we could say there is a soul present in both the cat and the tiger. But you know, when I, if there is a cat and I clap, the cat will go away. But if the tiger and I clap, I will go away. <laughs> so equal vision does not necessarily mean equal action. <laughs> We see everyone equally, that means we understand that everybody is a soul and but we also have to see you know, how is this soul acting towards me. But don't take it too personally. That means, yes, this tiger is an enemy for me, but that doesn't mean that I have to hate the tiger. So it's not that if somebody is attacking us and we have equal vision, means you attack whatever you want, I will not do anything. No. It means we may have to fight, we may have to we may have to fight against someone, but we don't have to be against someone. There's a difference between the two. If somebody is attacking me, I have to fight against them. But that doesn't mean I hate them. That doesn't mean I have, uh, I am bent on destroying them. So Krishna tells Arjuna that you can also see that there is the Supreme within Duryodhana's heart also. But right now, Duryodhan is so ba uh, so insistent on doing evil, he is not ready to listen. Therefore, you have to attack him. But what happens if we see the hand of Krishna over there, then we don't simply react at the level at which they are acting. Externally, it may appear they are attacking and they are attacking us, and we are counter countering them. It might appear the same way that we are, we are doing, but we are not at the same level of consciousness. And we are not at that level of consciousness because our vision is different. So this is how this Jnana Chakshu can enable us to <laughs> see things in a more educated way. So Shastra Chakshu or Jnana Chakshu, this whole Prakriti Purusha. So what is the whole point of understanding this Kshetra Kshetra? And when you interact with people, don't just see that this person is against me or this person is acting like this. See that this person is a soul, next to them is a super soul and then they have a particular body. And each particular body functions in a particular way. So let me respond appropriately when they act with me in a particular way. Hmm? Let's go to the last text, 35. I said the whole point of this anal analysis is to help us attain liberation. So let's recite this verse. Kshetra Kshetra Gya Yorevam Antaram Jnana Chakshusha Bhuta Prakriti Moksham Cha Ye Viduryanti Te Param So Krishna is saying over here, with this whole purpose of this analysis is what? That in, if you understand this, then you will be able to understand the difference between matter and spirit. Kshetra Kshetra Gyanyor Evam Antaram You will be able to understand the difference between matter and consciousness. How? Jnana Chakshusha with the eyes of knowledge. And if you can act with that knowledge then what will happen? Bhuta Prakriti Moksham Cha The Bhuta, the living being who is caught in Prakriti can come out of Prakriti, can attain liberation. So the purpose of this knowledge is to provide Arjuna a pathway to liberation. So this is the overall summary of the uh, 13th chapter. Any questions about this? Yes, please. Prabhuji, in uh, text 29 and uh, 26, where uh, Krishna's favorite was that Atmana, Atmana. So the, the meaning seems to be different. Uh, one is degraded by the mind, so degraded, soul degraded by the mind. Another one is like, it's talking about super soul. 
to why is that uh, atma is referred as like one one place of soul and one place of soul see it's uh, the there is a there is an article somewhere i think in ox somebody sent me in oxford uh, is in the oxford dictionary home page something like that uh, the article was about that has run run mad what it means is the word run seems to have something like 90 or 100 meanings and it seems that is one of the word which has the longest meanings so for example you say are you running for the marathon and are you running for the elections <laughs> and now when you are running for the election not literally running isn't it so uh, uh, we can use the word run in so many different ways sorry is <laughs> is the is the gadget running or is the gadget is the tap working or tap running so we could use it uh, the word run we use in so many different senses so now there is a lot of sensitivity to context now oh, like uh, there is a particular disease i think asperger syndrome or something like that not asper yes. anyone know that asperger 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 okay yeah so what is that syndrome that the person <coughs> takes everything very literally <laughs> oh you know he has run to india he has run away to india he must have had to run for a long time <laughs> 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 so the point i'm making over here is that we when we in our, in our normal conversations we do use words with different meanings and based on the context we all make sense of it so the, the nature of language is such that one word can have different meanings and similarly the word atma can have different meanings so atma can mean mind atma can even mean intelligence atma can mean soul atma can mean the super soul atma can also mean um, ego in some conscious some senses like uh, so deha atma buddhi that means the self conception is about the body so once intelligence so the, there are various different ways in which the word atma can be used so that's the dynamism of language and if we are sensitive to the context then we understand which meaning works over there in fact mo- much of humor comes by using words in different senses you know, we use a particular word in a particular sense are we expected to be used in a particular sense but we use it in another sense uh, i one of the things which i often start my corporate seminars with is that two, there are two kinds of people mm-hmm. some people are wise and some are otherwise <laughs> 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 now here otherwise it is otherwise means alternatively but otherwise it is the opposite of wise so it could mean if so basically my point is that we understand in language when it's actually being spoken which meaning is being used in that context so yes in different contexts krishna may use different words and we have to also remember the bhagavad gita is poetry so poetry means there is there is there is a lot of poetic ornaments one of the ornaments is use words in different senses so that's the beauty of the bhagavad gita as a literature okay any other questions yeah the, the medicinal knowledge like uh, studying uh, the anatomy of the body it sounds like uh, uh, knowledge of the field of uh, psychology where does that fit in okay good question so word if we consider kshetra uh say anatomy would be that we knowledge of kshetra yes and no it, again i said i said that whenever we acquire knowledge it's always connected with a particular purpose so generally if uh, were you there in yesterday's class so i explained this example of how and if somebody asks you what do you remember about the room here most of us would say that okay you know, there were some sofas behind there's a carpet below there's a chair and there was a tv screen now how many of us might remember okay how many lights were there on the roof or how many pegs were there on the wall if you don't really take consider that knowledge so that means now if it is important if you wanted to hang something then we look where all the pegs are there 
but otherwise you won't consider that so in general when we look at a particular thing or a particular situation we look basically uh, what will get in my way and what will get me along the way what will take me along and what will block me so that's what we try to seek to know so now we could say this knowledge of anatomy can also be knowledge of kshetra of course but in the context of the bhagavad gita it is more about bondage and liberation what is the kind of action that we should do by which we can live harmoniously we can live in a way that we evolve and not that we get entangled that is the stress so in that context understanding how material nature works is important but more important is how material nature can entangle us and how we can stay disentangled from material nature so understanding from that perspective is more important let's answer your question thank you any other questions okay so now let's move on to chapter 14 so actually chapter 13 took a little longer time because i was also setting some concepts overall in the study of the gita so here there is no explicit question by arjuna which starts the 14th chapter but arjuna has asked some questions about sankhya the six terms he asked another very foundational concept in sankhya is guna the modes of material nature so <clears throat> krishna himself starts explaining what the modes are because those to understand the sankhya world view you have to understand the modes world modes basically it's like say if we want to understand ayurveda and ayurvedic treatment now we might ask somebody okay you know what is jatharagni or what are what is this what is that we can ask about some general terms and it is useful to know okay what is panchakriya uh, panchakarma or there are certain kind of what is uh, this what does this mean what does this mean? that's good but if you want to understand ayurveda basically how ayurvedic treatment works we need to understand kapha vata pitta the fundamental components of the body so like that krishna has explained the kshetra kshetra gya all those six terms but foundational for understanding the uh, sankhya world view is the concept of the gunas and krishna has used the gunas extensively throughout the gita <coughs> so he starts by talking about the modes of material nature so let's go to the second text over here okay <coughs> let's uh, recite this idam gyanam upashritya idam gyanam upashritya mama sadharmya magatah mama sadharmya magatah sarge pi nopajayante sarge pi nopajayante pralaye na vyathanti cha So Krishna is telling over here, what is the point of this knowledge? Maybe you can can write down the summary of this. So the significant word over here is idam gyanam upashritya. This knowledge is not just to be studied. Upashritya is to be taken shelter of. So when you take shelter of this knowledge, what will happen? You will attain liberation. Sarge pi no pajayante. That you will not take birth again the next time, and he is not saying you will not die. it's significant pralaye na vyathanti cha at the time of destruction you will not be distressed so as the, the death causes destruction or death causes distress to the extent we are very attached now for the attached what happens at the time of death we leave home but for those who are materially attached and those who are attached to krishna at the time of death we don't leave home at the time of death we go home so in that sense the pralaye na vyathanti cha will not be distressed at the time of death so there are uh, <coughs> let's start with it so texts 1 uh, 2 talk about 1 and 2 they talk about the importance of understanding the modes so what is the benefit of knowing about it that will be liberated importance of understanding the modes then 3 to 5 is introduction or 3 to 4 you could put it 3 to 4 that is 
uh, introduction to the soul's entanglement the soul's entanglement in the world of the modes in the world of the modes so what does it mean that say if somebody is watching a movie now somebody might be watching a cricket match somebody might be watching a horror movie somebody might be watching a romantic movie people might different people are watching different things so now one way to if you want to them to stop watching that thing one way we can understand is okay what made them start watching it how did they get start watching it maybe they were bored or maybe they were they just wanted to forget the world they wanted to, they wanted to break from the stress or whatever so how do the soul get entangled in the world that is is described by the lord's arrangement material nature is eternal material nature is like the womb and the lord is the impregnator here there is a famous verse aham bija pradaha pita krishna says i am the seed giving father who impregnates material nature that's how the soul comes in this world and then from 5 to 9 is introduction to the modes so what exactly are the modes okay let's do the review first and then we will move forward then we could say Mm. from 10 to 13 is 11 12 13 yeah it's competition among the modes how different modes they tussle they have tussle with each other each mode different mode comes up mm. competition among modes then 14 to 18 is <laughs> result of the modes results results of the modes when we live in a particular way and a particular mode what happens by that and then 19 to 27 is transcending the modes okay so transcending the modes thank you kill set now so uh, now i talked about till the fourth text so let's go to the fifth one and let's recite the fifth one <coughs> satvam rajas tama iti satvam rajas tama iti guna prakriti sambhava prakriti sambhava निबंधनति महाबाहो निबंधनति महाबाहो देहे देहि नमव्ययम देहे देहि नमव्ययम सो सत्व रज तमदि द थ्री मोड्स एंड व्हाट डू दे डू देहे देहि नमव्ययम इम्पेरिशेबली दे बाइंड अव्यय इट्स अ इम्पेरिशेबल बॉन्डेज इट इज नेवर गेट्स एग्जॉस्टेड निबंधनति दे बाइंड द सोल एंड नाउ it's like say some people are watching him i saw once a poster it was like of tv addiction so it was like a person is watch, is watching a tv but they're not only they're watching a tv but while they're trying to watch the tv they're trying to turn away but it's like hands have come out of the tv and are catching them <laughs> keep watching <laughs> they're not allowing them to turn itself so that's how we can get hooked nowadays maybe for many people tv has also become old fashioned you could say smartphone addiction we can say <laughs> they just get hooked to the phones or whatever device so like that these three modes basically the modes are subtle forces which shape the interaction between matter and consciousness when a person is watching the tv you know what kind of program do they gravitate towards how do how they stay held on to that programs so that is the subtle forces which shape the interaction between consciousness and matter so one way i explain it is about the three modes i say is that some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened <laughs> <laughs> so those who make things happen are in goodness those who watch things happen are <coughs> they watch things they want to do one thing 
but they forget this or they neglect this and they make a mess of things so many things happen which they didn't want to happen and those who wonder what happened they are in yes they are just in their own world they don't even know what's going on around them so basically why does this happen because when we are perceiving the world we get caught in a particular way of perceiving say we could say with respect to now just looking at a tv screen or a computer screen now you could have just some people just passively sit and watch now this is a very vague example a very not a vague a very you could say a crude example so somebody is reading and contemplating and learning something you know can do active study on the uh, computer screen also or somebody is playing a video game press this press this this moves here this moves there so they can be completely absorbed or somebody is just sitting and watching a movie and when changes second third fourth like that so like that when interacting with the world we can be learning from it that's probably in sattva guna we can just be bossy, trying to be bossy trying to control things that's rajas we are passively observing that tamas so these three are the modes and now when we talk about each of these modes krishna says each of them has some characteristics relatively speaking if somebody is going to watch a movie or a device uh, uh, is going to look on a computer you know if as parents if they are doing something looking at something educational then it's good you are doing that but is going for entertainment or something which is inappropriate and they stop that so the modes can be of various uh, the modes are different ways in which we interact with the world and krishna says among these three modes there is each mode has its particular characteristic sattva has the characteristic of gyana it provides us knowledge so can you go to the next works i'll just quickly mention it we will not recite it i think we are a little bit running out of time now so krishna says that tatra sattvam nirmalatvat prakashakam anamayam prakasha is illumination that's knowledge anamayam maya is sin so we are free from sin it keeps us free from sin and it keeps us in knowledge hmm? and therefore among all these modes tatra tatra is among these three modes tatra sattvam nirmalatvat it is purest among all the modes and sattva krishna will later say that sattva sanjayate gyanam sattva is very conducive for acquiring knowledge gyana sangena chanagha but still sattva also leads us to bondage because of sukha definitely life is comfortable <coughs> life is nice not comfortable in the sense of gross comforts like sensual comforts but comfortable in the sense that i have my own secure position in my life and i am better off than most people i am wiser than most people and that can also bind so that's sattva and like that krishna gives characteristics of each of the modes and then can you go to ninth text because the whole the point of krishna is arjun arjun's concern is if i act i will be bound and how can i act without being bounding so the whole analysis will move towards in the 18th chapter that you can if you act in sattva then you will be uplifted you will not be bound so the whole purpose of analyzing sattva is to help one to become detached it like say somebody is Uh, addicted to uh, say the internet but on the internet only they can read about internet addiction <laughs> and by reading about internet addiction on the internet they might gradually get detached from the internet isn't it so of course it's it you have it everything has to be done properly say like some people when they read about the about the harmful effects of drinking what do they do they stop reading <laughs> <laughs> so now that's an <laughs> that's the exact opposite of the behavior that has to be desired so we can read on the internet about internet addiction and that can help us decrease the internet addiction also so sattva is similarly a way of interacting with the material world in a way by which we understand the entangling nature of the material world and we start becoming detached from it but still 
there is some entanglement in sattva also. So Krishna gives a summary over here. Can you recite this verse? Sattvam sukhe sanjayati. Sattvam sukhe sanjayati. Rajaha karmani bharata. Rajaha karmani bharata. Jnana maurutya tutamaha. Jnana maurutya tutamaha. Pramade sanjayatyauta. Pramade sanjayatyauta. So Krishna says, uh, in sattva we are bound by sukha. Rajaha karmani bharata. In Rajaha karma. I have to do this, I have to do that. Like some some kids when they start playing video games, so busy, you press this button, press this button, move it like this, move it like this. They, sick. they are completely lost in their own world. There was some game which created something like traffic accidents and what is it? Pokemon Go or something like that. Mm, Pokemon, Go. Pokemon Go. So it's like people just get completely consumed by that. I have to do this, I have to do that. Press this, press this, press this. Press. Just get oblivious to everything else. So, Raja Karma Raja Karmani Bharata. But then, Jnanam Avrutte Tutamaha. So, when somebody becomes a drunk and is lying down, just not aware of anything, they are lost inside their head itself. So, that is also another kind of bondage where they are not connected with anything at all. Pramade Sanjayatyauta. Pramada is intoxication. So different ways there can be bondage by the three modes. Then after talking about it, then Krishna says that these modes, they are not just passive forces. It like say, if you could say broadly speaking, you have a TV on which nowadays we can have maybe 50 channels, 100 channels on a TV. But broadly you could maybe categorize the channels in some particular, you could have educational TV, you can have entertainment TV. You can have sports channel, you can have movie channel. They like on in the airplanes also. They have you have various kinds of options for entertainment. So like that we could say sattva reyas tamas are three options within the uh, the array of options that material world offers us. But with respect to with respect to our TV or with respect to the TV in an airplane, it is just passively over there. Now we can choose whichever one you want. But with respect to the modes, the modes are not just passively, they are not passive forces. They are active agents. Sattva can pull us, Rajas can pull us and Tamas can also pull us. And depending on which one is pulling us, we will get pulled in that direction. So, Krishna in the next verse says that these three modes are pulling us. Rajas Tamascha Vibhuya Sattvam Bhavati Bharataha Rajasattvam tamaschaiva, tamahasattvam rajasattha. Sometimes one mode goes up, sometimes another mode goes up. Mm. And in that way, that's how our moods change. Most people don't know about moods, but everybody knows about moods. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Oh, I have mood swings. So now what is happening mood swings? It is not mood swings, it's mood mood swings. swings. <laughs> and the moods are swinging us from here to there. They're like a puppet. They're pulling us here, pulling us there. And now what happens, uh, now how can we know, after talking about this, Krishna says, okay, how if these modes are pulling against you, Krishna is, Arjuna is a warrior. So in a war, the warrior also has to understand, hey, okay, which, which, which party has the upper hand now? If a fight is going on, is this party winning, is this party winning? Like say, say a cricket match is going on, then there are all these, uh, what is what, betters, is the word betting here used over here? Yeah. Okay. So they say, no, okay, the odds are this uh, India will win is 40%, Pakistan will be 60%. But then 1% bats very well, then the odds change. Say now India winning is 60%, Pakistan winning is 40%. So the odds keep changing like that. So similarly, we understand it's dynamic which mode is above. So how do we understand which mode is above? Just so like which team is winning? There are certain ways in which, oh, how is the batting going on, how is the balling going on, how is the pitch going on, based on that we can understand. So Krishna also says we can infer which mode is rising within us. And actually after a mode has taken us over, then to control it is very difficult. But while it is rising, at that time if we try to control it, we identify this mode is increasing now, let me control it. Then it is relatively easier. It's like if a snowball is rolling down a mountain, when it is at the top, it's very small. At that time, we just if we just flip it with our toe, it will break and it will stop. But as it starts coming down, 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 it becomes, it gains mass, 
it gets momentum. It just becomes not just a snowball, it can become a snow boulder. And then stopping it will be almost impossible. So when Krishna is telling, identifying how a particular mode rises within us. Then we can choose, okay, this is the mode rising. Do I want this to rise? Or do I not want it to rise? So that characteristics he gives in the next three verses. So let's go to the 11th verse now. So Krishna basically uses one iconic word to describe each mode. So here he uses the word Prakasha. <laughs> Let's recite this. Sarvadware shude hesmin. Sarvadware shude hesmin. Prakasha upajayate. Prakasha upajayate. Gyanam yada tada vidya. Gyanam yada tada vidya. Vivruddham sattvamityuta. Vivruddham sattvamityuta. So the Bhagavad Gita is, as I said, a poetry. And poetry means many times. <coughs> Metaphorical usages are there. So, Sarvadware Shudehe Smin. For all the doors of the body, there is illumination. Now, what? Now, which are the doors to the body? Which are the doors? Eyes, 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 eyes. Yeah, basically the senses. Yeah. Is it the working senses? <laughs> primary knowledge acquiring senses, we could say. The eyes, ears. Now, Krishna is saying all the doors of the body are illuminated. For one who is Sattva. Does, what does it mean? If somebody is Sattva, they open their eyes and suddenly rays of light come out from there. You look at their ears, hey, some bright light comes out of their ears. Is that what is being referred to? No. What is being referred to then here? Understanding how to use them. Yes, exactly. If you consider the word dwar, a door, say if there is a door which is open, but around that all the area is dark then we will not know who has slipped in and who has slipped out. Sometimes a thief might slip in, sometimes a child might slip out. So what happens is that if the door is illumined, we can choose what comes in, what com goes out. So similarly for us, when it says senses are illumined, that means we are aware of what we are taking in through our senses and what we are uh, giving out through our senses, means what words we are speaking, what we are looking at. Nowadays, there is a lot of concern about, say, like a screen addiction or internet addiction or uh, whatever. Uh, overall, on the internet, there's so much different kind of content that is available. Content people might get attached to that also, addicted to that. So normally, what happens if somebody is taking alcohol? When we we see somebody taking some substance, say it's like somebody takes a drug, they take a shot of a drug, or they take alcohol. When we see somebody taking a substance into the body then this is serious, don't do this, something like this. You know, it's, but what happens, from the mind's perspective, for impressions to be formed, for the consciousness to be affected, what goes in through our mouth and what goes in through our eyes is similar. The effect will be similar. In terms of forming impressions on the mind, whether there is a physical contact or not doesn't make a difference. In fact, uh, researchers have found that those who get addicted to the internet, they, in their brain also gets rewired in a particular way. The whole, of course, the wiring can be changed, but the basic principle in the working of the brain is that the neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> that means if we keep doing a particular activity repeatedly, then those neuronal pathways get linked very quickly. And then we get prompted to do those kind of actions again very easily. So the point here is that Illumination means, okay, what I take in through my eyes, it's not just casual. Just as I have to be careful what I take in through my mouth, I have to be careful what I take in through my eyes also. So that's 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 the understanding in Sattva. So the defining characteristic of Sattva is Prakash, illumination. And the defining characteristic of Rajas, can you go to the next verse, is Prakrit, is, is <coughs> Pravrutti, not Prakriti, but Pravrutti. So, pravritti means action, I have to act, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. So, what happens is that uh, when people are too caught in the action mode, then they are so eager to do something that the contemplation mode gets in the background. So, uh, nowadays there is a lot of propaganda that video games can also help, help uh, kids to grow intellectually and learn and develop and there are some games which are like 
portrayed as learning games. You play this, let your child play this game and he will become an Einstein or something like that. Now, yes, certain games might be better than other games, but broadly speaking, researchers have found that we have two kinds of attention. You could say there is intentional attention and there is reactional attention. Intentional attention means what we want to, we choose with our intention to focus on something. Reactional attention means some stimulus comes up and we respond to that. So most of the video games and most of the internet, uh, most of what we see in the digital media today, that increases our reaction attention. If at all somebody plays this, oh, this thief has come from here. Oh, this thing has happened over here. This thing has happened over here. And usually, the kids can be extremely sharp at it. If we start playing a video game and a kid has been playing a video game, they will just beat us effortlessly because they become sharp at it. But the problem with that is, you say, isn't it? They're so sharp. They're so alert. Isn't that? Isn't that good? Well, at one level, it's good that they're so sharp, but the problem is that when they get so attached to such fast stimuli coming in, this pops up from here, this pops up from here, this pops up from here, then because of <coughs> that, real life starts appearing boring. Because in life, things don't happen that fast. And, where, and that's why then the relatively calmer stimuli of day-to-day -day life, this become desensitized to that. It like, say some people are very effusive about their display of affection. They come and give a big hug and in the western world people also kiss and do all kinds of things like that. But, you know, affection might be conveyed in that way, but somebody else might be just, you know, they just tap us on the shoulder or just press the shoulder. Affection can be conveyed in that way also. But if somebody who has got very attached to that very effusive way of expressing affection, and then somebody touches on the shoulder. They will not even notice. You are very unloving. It's not that they are unloving. They are showing you love in a different way. So what happens when we get too caught in high speed stimuli coming up, then real life is never that fast. We just get deadened by real life. So in Rajas what happens? I have to act, I have to act, I have to act. Like I just can't sit peacefully and think. And then, in Prakasha Pravritti and for Tamoguna it is Moha. Moha is illusion. The person is just not aware of anything. So, so that means we could put in what is in by Moha? See in Sattva one is observing how material nature works and then acting appropriately. In Rajas one is caught in trying to control material nature. Uh, but in Tamas one is just passively, there is not even the attempt much to control physical nature or physical world. This one is lost in one side, one side. What about this? What about that? What about that? What about that? The tamas is complete passivity. So that is are all different modes. So when we start, start feeling reflective, uh, that's where we can understand. Okay, now the mode of goodness is rising. Maybe this is a good time for me to study. This is a good time to contemplate. But we start feeling hyperactive. Do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. Now, Rajas is rising within me. Okay. Now, maybe this is the time I, can, I should get some good work done. Now, none of the modes are intrinsically bad. So, tamas is also required. So, what, what do I have when tamas is required? It's when we become inactive. That's when we are able to sleep. You know, for many people, their bed is like a magical <coughs> place. As soon as they get on the bed, they remember all the things they have not done throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> and then, just can't sleep. Now, when we are on the bed, we should have some tamas coming in so that we can go to sleep. Our problem is, when we are on the bed, Rajas comes up. And we get off the bed, then tamas comes up. <laughs> so, so, each mode has its utility. But the mode has to come at the right time. And we can ourselves channel our activity. So if we understand, okay, you know, at this time I feel sleepy or after taking meals I feel a little sleepy. Then if that is the time when we try to do, when we are in, going toward tamas, that's the time we try to do sattvic activities. So after a heavy meal, then we say, I'll study Shastra. <laughs> and then I can't study Shastra and I say, oh, I have no taste for Shastra. Well, it's not no taste for Shastra. It is, we are not using our intelligence over there. 
So once we understand our own patterns of how of the modes work, then we can channel ourselves constructively. Mm -hmm. So any questions till now? Okay, so then now after that Krishna talks about the results of the modes. If we act in a particular mode, what will happen? Mm -hmm. So first he says that if you, he actually starts from the big picture. 14 and 15 he talks about when you die. If you die in a particular mode, then if you die in Sattva, you will get elevated. Mm -hmm. If you die in Rajas, we will stay where we are. If you die in Tamas, we will go into the lower levels of reality. So he talks about the long term results, the medium term results and the short term <coughs> results. So long term result is which where will we go after death. The medium term result is what kind of, uh, can you go to 16th text, 16th. So 14, 15 is talking about where we will go after death. But here it talks about the medium term result. Overall if we live in Sattva consistently what will happen? Karmana Sukruta Syahu Satvikam Nirmalam Phalam Rajasastu Phalam Dukkham Agyanantam Sahafalam So he says, so if you live in Sattva, gradually you will become purified. Satvikam Nirmalam Phalam Whereas if you live in Rajas, there might be some pleasure but in the long term there will be misery. In the medium term also there will be misery. So and then Tamas Agyana, it will simply increase our ignorance. This Rajasastu Phalam Dukkham is a very insightful point. If you are living in Rajoguna, it might feel good, but eventually the long term result is Dukkham. Dukkham. That is what will be the result of that. And then lastly, he says, this is the medium term result in 16th text. What is the short, uh, short term result? 17th verse, he says that Sattva Sanjayate Gyanam Rajaso Lobha Evacha Pramad Moha Tamaso Bhavato Gyanam Evacha. So as soon as we come in Sattva, we start learning, we start observing and learning, Jnana comes up. As soon as we come in Raja, Raja is more or less equated with more, more, more. I want this more, I want this more, I want this more, I want this more. And then Tama is just passivity. So this way he gives us the analysis of the modes of material nature. And after that, then he says if you can become an observer of the modes, then you can become liberated from the modes. Nanyam, go to 19th verse. Nanyam gunebhya kartaram yadad rashtanu pashyati gunebhya param vetti madbhavam sodhi gachyati. So if somebody is watching the TV, but they understand this is simply a show going on on the TV. It is just the moving of the pixels on the TV screen that is showing all this illusion. But I am different from it. So, na anyam gunebhya kartaram yada drashtanu pashyati. If you see, all that is happening is simply by the modes. But gunebhya shaparam vetti. I am situated separate from the modes. Then, madhaam sodhi gachyati. Such a person will get liberated and will attain madhaam sodhi gachyati. Will attain my abode. So, Krishna elaborates on this theme in the next verse further. And then, the 20th, uh, 21st verse, let us go there. Uh, where Arjun asks the question. Actually, he asked three questions over here, and we'll conclude with this part. So, Arjun Vacha Kailinga is three in Guna Nathan Atito Bhavati Prabho Atito Bhavati Prabho Kimachara Katham Chaitam Katham Chaitams Three in Guna Nati Vartate. So you ask three questions over here. Kair linga is three guna netan atito bhavati prabhu. If somebody has transcended the modes, what are the characteristics of that person? These are characteristics means what is the internal thought process, internal uh, way of thinking of the person. Then kim acharaha. So he's talking, if I am going to transcend the modes, how should my way of looking at the world be? How should I be thinking about? And if somebody has transcended the world, how can I observe? What will be their behavior? Kimachara. And then lastly, Katham Chaitams. How can I transcend the modes? So, what are internal characteristics? What are behavioral characteristics? And what is the process for transcending the modes? And the essentially, the remaining chapter is the answer to these questions. So, Kair Lingais. What are the characteristics? That is answered in 22 and 23. Then, 
kim achar what is the behavior is answered in 24 and 25 and then katham chaitams is answered in 26 and 27 so what does krishna say kairling guys how do we know we have transcended the modes essentially he says become an observer of your emotions you go ahead 22nd 22nd text so this is very beautiful udasinavadasinam you can see the third verse udasinavadasinam gunair yo na vichalyate guna vartante ityeva yo vatishthati nengate so udasinavadasinam be situated as if detached and now we cannot be completely detached if i am feeling angry if i am feeling irritated i am feeling bored yeah, these emotions are coming within me but be an observer of these so it's like say a cricket match is going on and there is a umpire in english there are two words there is what is it ah uh, disinterested and uninterested does anyone know what are the difference between the two words uninterested is to have no interest in something disinterested is to be impartial here the word interest comes more in terms of vested interests i have no vested interest over here so disinterested is impartial uninterested is having no interest at all uncaring you could say so say a cricket match is going on and the umpire is there and the bowler bowls and the ball goal it goes and hits the foot of the batsman the leg of the batsman and all the fielders appeal how's that they all turn towards the umpire and the umpire says i was not watching the match <laughs> what <laughs> if, if you're not watching the match what are you doing over here so the umpire cannot be uninterested in the cricket match isn't it <laughs> if the umpire is uninterested they, they cannot perform as umpire but the umpire should also not be or should be disinterested, disinterested. the umpire should not be in favor of one team every appeal get out 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 it cannot be like that so that means the umpire has to evaluate the each appeal on merit and then give a decision so similarly krishna is saying become an umpire of your emotions observe udasin avadasin and then if you understand that yeah these emotions are coming these are like players who are rising and appealing loudly but i am different from them now it's not that just because every emotion has arisen that means i have to suppress it nor does it mean i have to express it just like some appeals the umpire accepts some appeals the umpire doesn't accept and that is based on merit so similarly it's we cannot completely reject the influence of the modes see when we say somebody has transcended the modes that doesn't mean that the modes will not affect them at all rather the modes will not control them it will not control them it will not determine their actions desires might come up moods might come up but they won't dominate them they won't control them so one way krishna talks about uh, if we can become an observer of our emotions observer of our thoughts and actually it's very powerful If, if we start getting angry, and if we just say in our mind, "Okay, yeah, now I am getting angry," now uh, that means now now I am getting angry, or you could put more, now anger is coming up, anger is rising within me. So as soon as we verbalize this, what happens is that itself activates our thought process, our intelligence, and then say, "Okay, anger is something which is rising within me. Now is this really worth it, getting angry, or is this the right time to get angry? Is the right time to express my anger?" so we can, if the anger rises and we explore that's one way the other is the anger rises but okay let me hold back let me observe based on observing let me decide that's another way of looking at it so that's the uh, what krishna is saying become an observer so the kairlinga is what are the characteristics or how can i know that i have transcended if i learn to observe my emotions and then i can process them appropriately just like the umpire processes the appeals and then how do we know the second question was kim achar uh, how do you know somebody has transcended krishna says that this person is equipoised that means we go to 24 25 krishna says that uh, well whenever there is happiness and distress that person does not get elated when there is happiness and the person doesn't get dejected when there is distress 
it is equipoised in both and so now this is broadly we could say the more the path of introspection or contemplation but then there is also the path of devotion and that is the last that is the next verse how can one transcend the modes he says 26th verse he says is oh what did he put 19 to 27 27 no, yeah it's 27 27 so, okay sorry i think i should have it here so this is a well known verse let's recite this Mam chayo vyabhicharena together. Mam chayo vyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevate sabunan samati tyaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate. So Krishna says, uh, How can you go beyond the modes? Become fixed in devotion to me. So, uh, how, what does this mean? Actually, you may say that is my devotion only is interrupted by the modes. Isn't it? So I feel devotional sometimes, I sometimes don't feel devotional. And if my devotion is interrupted by the modes, then Krishna is saying, by un uninterrupted devotion, you go beyond the modes. What's going on over here? It, it's like, say, somebody saying that, <coughs> okay, it, it, because of your low immunity, your sickness has uh, come. So to get rid of the sickness, increase your immunity. Okay, you could say it's causal, the immunity is low, sickness will increase. Because sickness is increased, immunity also goes further down. So, where do we begin? It's the old question, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? So, what do you start with? You start with the chicken or with the egg? What do you think? The egg. Start with what you have. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> what this means is <laughs> that do we start with say uninterrupted devotion because I want to practice uninterrupted devotion but on the other hand the modes are interrupting my devotion. So, first let the modes go down then I will focus on uninterrupted devotion or do I start devotion and then the modes will go down. It will just begin with what you can. When we have sattva, practice devotion more nicely but when the modes go down try to hold on to your devotion as well as we can. I gave the earlier example of the anchor in one of the earlier classes. Remember that when the waves come, if I try to fight against the waves, it's very difficult. So this is a good example to understand that point of anchor. The waves are coming and when the waves come, fighting the waves is not possible. But holding on to the anchor, that's also difficult, but relatively it's easier. If I hold on to the anchor, then gradually, the gradually what will happen? things will fall, the, the waves will go. So here, Krishna says, if you just hold on to me devotionally, by the practice of bhakti, then gradually you will go beyond the modes. And the last verse, this is more or less the conclusion, but here Krishna gives a twist in the tale, in the sense that, he says, what will happen? The previous verse, he says, it's interesting, what Krishna is saying is, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpati by which you will attain Brahman. Now normally we say Bhakti is not meant to attain Brahman. Isn't Bhakti is meant to attain Bhagawan. Isn't it? So then why is in this chapter, in this chapter, in the 14th chapter, why is Krishna saying that by practicing Bhakti you will attain Brahman? The point is that this chapter has a particular focus. This chap the focus of this chapter is to talk about the three modes and how to go beyond the three modes. Now specifically what exists beyond the three modes, that is not the essential message of this chapter. The, see, there can be a, if there is a generic class, you can have generic discussion. But if there is a specific class on a specific topic, then we have to have a discussion on that topic. Uh, so Krishna, so it's like once a devotee was giving a class and he said before the before the class started, he said, okay, so which verse should I speak on? The devotee will take back. Then he looked at all the Prabhus, okay, you tell any number between 1 to 18. One devotee said something, 14. Okay, then he looked at all the ladies. You tell a number between 1 to 27. And somebody said 5, okay, I'll speak on 14, 5. <laughs> I started speaking like that. And then the devotee said, Oh, you might think I am very proud. And I know the Bhagavad Gita so much that I can speak on any verse. I'll tell you a secret. He says, Whichever 
once you had told me, I would have spoken the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, we can have a core message of Krishna consciousness that we can, uh, we can, so sometimes Bhagavad Gita verses can be elastically stretched, you know. <laughs> so, it's like a, if you have an elastic rubber band, uh, you can decide on what object you want to put that band. <laughs> so like that, this is the topic I want to speak. So I'll stretch this verse and I put it on and speak about this verse in this way. You can do like that. But here Krishna's thrust is not so much on talking about what is there at the spiritual level of reality. Here the thrust is, okay, there are the modes and how to go beyond the modes. So Krishna focuses primarily on that. And so when he says Brahma Bhuyaya, here is not the word Brahma does not necessarily talk about Brahma Jyoti. It simply talks about the spiritual level. Now in the spiritual level, there is Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagwan, and that's a different subject. But in case somebody might think like that, oh, this is meant for merging in Brahman. So by practicing bhakti, one will attain mukti and merge in Brahman. Krishna immediately gives a caveat. Caveat means a warning. No. The last verse says. This, okay, this Brahman platform is there, but Brahmano hi pratishtaham. I am the foundation of Brahman. Brahman is sustained by me. Brahman is my effulgence. Brahman can't exist without me. So that way Krishna is, so is and later on we will see, in the 18th chapter Krishna says, by bhakti you will go beyond Brahman and attain me. And I will talk about it when you come to 1854-55. But essentially when Krishna is talking here about Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpati, he is not referring to the Brahma Jyoti, but he is talking about the Brahman level. That is the non-material level of reality. You will transcend the modes and attain a non-material level of consciousness. So that is the 14th chapter. Any questions about this? Yes, please. About the modes, you said that they are intrinsically not bad. Intrinsically, yeah. So at the time of death, if one is aware of the mode, then it will have any effect. Good question. So if no mode is intrinsically bad, then if at the time of death, if we are simply aware of our mode, but if we are in say, if Tamaguna is coming over us, is that bad? I think it will depend on time, place, circumstance again. Essentially, as devotees, we try to create sattva as much as possible mm -hmm. around us. So, or, or even not in Shastra, Shuddha Sattva, you could say, we can have pictures of Krishna, some spiritual music, Tulsi, and maybe devotees around, as many spiritual symbols as possible. But, the specific way in which somebody dies, if somebody is conscious, and while conscious they speak, maybe they speak Hare Krishna, or they hear Hare Krishna, and then they depart. Or somebody departs in their sleep. Now, is it that somebody departing in their sleep is bad? Not necessarily. You could say that if you are sleeping there in Tamaguna, and from Tamaguna they are departing, if they are awake, and uh, then then they depart from there. It's uh, it's when you talk about remembering Krishna, it's not uh, that simple in the sense that it's not that external. That oh, this person was awake and Krishna's name was being chanted, and that's good. We can from our part we should provide that facility. But it's not a way of uh, tricking or denying the way we have lived throughout our life. If somebody lives sensually throughout their life and then they feel, okay, I have had enough now, and they take a gun and they hold the gun on their head, Hare Krishna! <laughs> and they press the trigger. Will they have Antakale? They remembered Krishna and will they go to Krishna? Because it's not simply chanting Krishna, it's remembering Krishna. Antakale cha maameva smaran muktva kaleva means smaran is required. The smaran is not there, nothing will happen. So in that sense, it's important that uh, we be remembering Krishna. And this remembrance is not just the, it's not like a intellectual act of recollection. It's like, you know, somebody, you ask somebody, what is 13 into 13? Oh, 13 into 13. I learned that in my childhood, but I've forgotten now. It's not like that. That's not what Krishna says, you remember me. That remembrance is more based on affection. 
based on attachment to Krishna. Just like when we love someone, we naturally remember that person. So similarly, so Krishna is talking about that. And even if somebody is say asleep, if they develop attachment to Krishna, then the body might be inactive, but the soul and the consciousness will be active and connected with Krishna. Somebody might be fully awake, but if they are not chanted Hare Krishna, they will not be able to remember Krishna. Or they are not, uh, they have not necessarily developed attachment to Krishna. Even if there is Krishna vibration all around, they might not themselves be able to remember Krishna. So we don't have to worry too much. In the eighth chapter, towards the end, Krishna says that Naite Sruti Parth Janan Yogi Muhyati Kashina the Smart Sarveshu Kaleshu Yoga Yukto Bhava Arjuna. He says that yeah, there, there is some people who say we should die in Uttarayan, not Dakshinayan, die in the daytime, not in the night time. He says, yeah, these are different paths, but don't worry too much about this. If you are engaged in yoga, then whatever way you die, that's auspicious. That's why we focus more on cultivating remembrance of Krishna as much as we can. Specifically, what time, in what, what mode we die, that doesn't matter so much. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Prabhuji, um, see, we often uh, we talk about uh, pure goodness, which is beyond uh, the three modes. W why is Krishna the why why didn't Krishna give that option? Like, uh, uh, why only Krishna talks about three modes? Why not the pure goodness? <coughs> Why does Krishna not talk about pure goodness? It's not that Krishna doesn't talk about pure goodness. He doesn't use the term Shuddha Sattva specifically. But when he's talking about a transcendental state, what does it mean? It's pure goodness itself. When Krishna is talking about something beyond Sattva, Brahma Bhuya Yakalpate, then he's talking about basically transcendence. He's talking about Shuddha Sattva itself. So certain terms may be used in particular places, certain terms may not be used. It's like some people can become um, very finicky. Like somebody said that, in, in, I gave a class and he said that is, my whole class was in Bhagavad Gita. But after that one devotee said, hey, you didn't use the word Prabhupada even once in your class. Well, I said, I'm talking about Bhagavad Gita. We are studying Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. So it's based on that. Now that way you could say Prabhupada in his whole Bhagavad Gita as it is doesn't refer even once to Bhakti Sarasvati Thakur. Well, that's because Bhakti Sarasvati Thakur did not write a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. Isn't it? So Prabhupada wrote extensively his Chaitanya Charitamrita commentary based on Bhakti Sarasvati Thakur's um, Gaudiya compilation of various commentaries. But Prabhupada doesn't refer to that any time. It doesn't refer to Bhakti Siddhanta, that book specifically. So certain terms may or may not be used. In fact, one of the points that many academic scholars they talk about is that the word avatar does not come in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, it doesn't come, but the concept of avatar is very much there. Yada, yada, hi, dharmasya. One of the most well-known words in the Bhagavad Gita. But just because the word doesn't come, that doesn't mean the concept is not there. So, during normal conversations, we speak in a particular way and at that time we use certain words. So Shuddha Sattva is a particular term <coughs> that may not be used <coughs> in the Bhagavad Gita but the concept is there. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, any other questions? So, okay. In uh, 1426, my translation says, Unfailing in all circumstances. So how does we? How should we understand? Should we be critical about something that? Okay. How do you understand unfailing in all circumstances? Mamcha yo avyabhichar ena. So avyabhichar. Now what does it mean? It can mean say, vyabhichar is like inappropriate behavior or. Uh, in Hindi, it is used to say some <coughs> relationship outside marriage or something like that. Vyabhichar, you can say that. What is the fourth regulative principle we say? Avaid. That's in, in, so basically, now you could have various levels of sensuality. 
you could just uh, we could talk about somebody looking in a particular in appropriate way somebody fantasizing in a particular way not just looking somebody you know talking in an appropriate way somebody can actually physically take things forward somebody can you know go all the way and there can be various levels so similarly now avyabhichar normally what is it expected that that basically at a at a physical level one has to be restrained we cannot always be restrained at the level of thoughts so similarly the word avyabhichar can be understood at different levels so broadly speaking what it would mean is in our context that we make sure that we follow the basic principles of bhakti the four regs the chanting during our sadhana if we are doing that that's good enough and gradually we will rise bhakti is not a necessarily a one zero process like it's not digital logic it's more like a analog progression this is maya this is krishna and we are trying to move from maya towards krishna so sometimes that graph of our consciousness might be going tilting more towards maya sometimes might tilting towards krishna but overall we are on that journey towards krishna so if we start thinking of it as 10 and then we think this is how i need to be always and if you're not like that then what then you'll think that i just give up krishna consciousness because i can't do it so we don't have to reduce krishna consciousness to particular standards alone we try to follow but even if we can't follow still we stay krishna conscious in whatever way we can so that avya vichare na we can also understand in terms of 93031 30, where krishna says apichet sudracharo bhajate mam ananya bhag now how acharya has given elaborate commentaries on this verse that if somebody is does a terrible wrong doing but they are uh, apichet sudracharo that's a terrible wrong doing bhajate mam ananya bhag but with undeviated but they are undeviatedly devoted to me but if somebody is undeviatedly devoted then how can they do a wrong doing and what to grievous wrong doing what it means over there is that their intention to serve krishna is never lost that means they don't think oh uh, i did such a terrible thing therefore what is the use of practicing krishna bhakti i give it up i did this terrible thing krishna i didn't want to do it and i don't want to repeat it but it happened for me and i'm sorry about it but no matter what happens i will keep serving you so we could say that uh, that without losing heart if somebody says determined to serve krishna even if that determination is not immediately translatable into action still that's okay okay thank you thank you had a question we'll come back to you here yeah. okay is it that if somebody is worship some other form and they are dying now is our chanting going to help them or are we helping ourselves certainly it will help them like i said it's not necessarily a zero one logic it's more of analog so instead of being a completely uh, material material consciousness over there having some spiritual consciousness is good now how much spiritual consciousness that can that will also depend on how receptive they are so definitely it helps how much will depend on their receptivity and are we helping ourselves that time yes in one sense because some is one of the biggest things when we see some somebody whom we care for in distress is the feeling of helplessness i can't do anything about it but if we can pray if we can chant and if that helps them then at least we feel i'm doing something for them and that's also helpful Yeah. <coughs> yes, bro. This question is not from this. This is from eighteenth chapter. Can we come to the eighteenth chapter then? Okay. Tomorrow, I think we'll come to it. So I'll summarize what I spoke to in today's class. I spoke about first the thirteenth chapter. Before that, I started with understanding the structure of the Bhagavad Gita, that it's an answer to a question of how to act. So dharma means that we want to understand. the overall scheme of things 
and our place and purpose in the overall scheme of things. So the Bhagavad Gita is like a class which starts with the answer to a question. But that class we can say it ends with the 10th chapter and then there are miscellaneous questions that come after the class. So that's why we might not find a linear flow between one chapter's question and the second chapter's question. Although we could trace such a flow. But if we can't, then what we see is these are general question answers after the particular class. So the 13th chapter questions do not necessarily have some lead in the 12th chapter. But they are about the general concept of Sankhya which Arjuna wants to understand in the light of what Krishna has spoken about bhakti. The world, so then he asks about these three things or six things rather Kshetra, Kshetra, Gya, Jnana, Gya and Purusha and Prakriti. So Krishna starts with uh, Kshetra and Kshetra, Gya although his question starts with Prakriti and Purusha because Krishna creates his own thought flow while answering that question. And then we talked about how our Kshetra is the particular area within material nature on which we have control and that can vary according to situation. Normally we can move our hands and legs, but suppose we get injured, then we can't. So like that our Kshetra changes and then Jnana here it can refer to any kind of knowledge in general, but here it refers in the context of Arjun not wanting to get entangled, to get liberated, it refers to the knowledge of the process by which we can get liberation. The, that's the, that refers to the cultivation of virtues and again the object of knowledge is what is it that we have to know when we get enlightened and get liberated that is Krishna the, the Atma and the Paramatma both and because this is uh, 13 chapter is uh, the Jnana section addressed towards people who are of a more intellectual orientation that's why it uses many paradoxical terms <coughs> and then we are talking about Purusha and Prakriti mm. therein I give the metaphor of person watching a TV and getting caught in watching the TV. So that is the metaphor which we will re revisit in the 15, subsequent chapters also. But we concluded by how if we can see that when a person is acting, it's not just that person acting, but rather the super soul is there and super soul is allowing and then person's, mo person's nature, person's modes are acting. Then we don't just react to their actions, but we, re we respond in a way that will take us closer to Krishna. Then our mind will not degrade us. Nahinasti Atman Atmanam. In 14th chapter, I talk about how first Krishna begins by telling, don't just understand this knowledge, take shelter of this knowledge. If you take shelter, then you will become uh, liberated. And then it introduces the concept of the modes, how the soul gets impregnated in the material world. And the modes are basically subtle forces by which the matter interacts with consciousness. Or consciousness interacts with matter rather. Then Krishna talks about how, he gives a broad description of the three modes. Then he talks about how the modes are having a tug of war. It like you could say three kinds of channels are there on a TV screen, on a TV, but then these are not just passive channels waiting for us to choose, they proposition us actively. And if we detect a particular mode when it is rising quickly, then we can channel it accordingly, check it or channel it appropriately. So Prakasha, Pravritti and Moha are the defining characters of each of the modes. And then Krishna talks about how what happens when we live within a particular mode and leave in a particular mode. So the long term, medium term and short term consequences of living in a particular mode, are each mode are described. And then the way to become liberated first is, Krishna says just become a detached observer. Like an umpire who is, who is disinterested but not uninterested. Udasina vadasina. Be situated not detached but as if detached. And then that's one way, that is the question which he answers is, how can I know that I am transcending the modes if I become an observer? How can I know if somebody is transcending the modes? That they are equipoised in life's ups and downs. And how to transcend? That is by practicing bhakti. So don't try to fight off the waves, but try to hold the anchor. If you hold the anchor, then the waves will be fought off automatically. So tomorrow we will continue and discuss the remaining four chapters. Let it go a little faster tomorrow, but we should be able to complete it. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki chai, Shri Madhagavad Gita ki, Tai Gaur Premanandhi.